you. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, it looks like the church is meeting with more uh, world leaders and specifically an ambassador from Saudi Arabia. And uh, this um, caught my attention when I was checking the church news. Why? Well, it's because, if you remember, I have a playlist for Islam. Okay, this comes up semi-frequently on the channel. And... Um, I did a video called, Are We Seeing the Council of 52.0? You can see it right here. I'll put the link for the playlist in the description below, and you can check this out. But this video in particular, you know, we were talking about what the origin was or what the purpose was of the Council of 50. Um, when Joseph Smith was still alive, uh, there was a Council of 50, and the object of it was to est basically establish the political kingdom of God. Uh, you know, uh, for the millennium. They drafted, or at least partially drafted, a constitution for the millennium. Uh, there was a flag for the kingdom of God, and it's it still exists today. I did a video about the flag of the kingdom of God, uh, so you can check that out. Sorry, let me pull that up, actually, because uh, this, this is something you may not know. Um, well, the only reason why I ever knew about it is because I lived in Utah, and at Ensign Peak, they, they have it flying, the flag of the kingdom of God. Let's see, flag, right here, flag of the kingdom of God. So, this came out of the Council of 50, and the Council of 50, um, you know, it was, it didn't really continue very long after Joseph Smith, if I remember, there were some things that happened that had to do with the Council of 50, but it's kind of not very active, or at least it doesn't go by the name of Council of 50 anymore, if at all. But I was wondering, with President Nelson, how he's been meeting with so many world leaders, more so than previous presidents. And um, Elder Rasban has pointed that out, uh, just how active he is in talking to world leaders, uh, both religious, political, and social leaders, right? And so I think that a part of this is because as we get closer to the millennium, it's going to be important for the church to have good relationships with these different religions and countries, right? Because the church is going to assume, you know, Christ is going to be king, he's going to have the political kingdom, and the church is essentially establishing this for him or getting it ready um, they are two separate entities. The, um, the political kingdom and the ecclesiastical kingdom are different. Uh, we do have the kingdom of God on the earth today, but it is ecclesiastical. But it is an introduction to the political kingdom of God. We, we read about that in one of these videos. So, I would encourage you to check out this video because I give all sorts of examples of just everyone that President Nelson specifically has met with. And here's the latest one. Uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit of this. It says, The ambassador of Saudi Arabia to the United States, Princess Rima um, bint Bandar al Saud, uh, met with top leaders of the headquarters of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints on August 8th and 9th, 2022. This is the second time the ambassador has visited the church, the church's global headquarters, which, um, you know, I wonder why it's, I, that part's not too clear to me. Um, you know, she's representing a nation, right? Saudi Arabia. Let's pull it up on the map. Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia holds a unique place in the world because it has the holiest site in all of Islam. About 24% of the world population is Muslim. And their holiest site is in Saudi Arabia. Okay, you see that? So for a, one out of four people on this planet, their holiest site is in Saudi Arabia. It's in Mecca. And here's a picture of it right here. In fact, let's pull this up. Here's Mecca. They have this, uh, th this is kind of new, this tower or this uh, building complex. It's actually one of the tallest buildings in the world, by the way. I'm kind of like a, a skyscraper enthusiast. But anyway, here's the Kaaba. This is uh, where all the Muslims, when they pray every day, they 
uh, face this direction toward this building, which they believe that Abraham built, which I'm, I'm not saying he didn't. I don't know. Um, so anyway, it, you know, whenever you have someone from the church talking to someone from Saudi Arabia, uh, this comes to mind, right? Saudi Arabia is a very important place for Islam. If you're Islamic, you're expected to, if you're, if you're able to, if like your health permits and your circumstances to uh, do the Hajj, which is uh, like a pilgrimage to here. And there's like a, there's a, like there's several, I don't want to call them, I don't know what you would call them, rituals or things that you participate in during the Hajj, including walking around the Kaaba seven times. And I think it's in a counterclockwise um direction if I remember right but there's other things that you do here in uh, Mecca if you're Muslim so uh, so it's very very important and I've talked about how in the millennium you know after the second coming after the wicked have been destroyed I, I can only assume that the proportions of religions right the percentages uh, would probably remain the same so in other words before the millennium after the millennium we're still probably going to have about 24% uh, Muslim population worldwide. And, um, you know, we've talked about how it's interesting that the church, they introduced this pamphlet right here. Okay. In fact, Elders Gong and Bednar uh, were the ones that kind of introduced this, pa this pamphlet. I think it was at BYU. In fact, let me pull this up so I can get the links. Uh, because you might want to check this out. Let's see. Okay, the, they don't have links in this video for it. What? Okay, what about this one? On the church website, if you didn't know, on the church website, we we now have a section of the church website that is for interfaith relations. That That's relatively new. And right now... What the heck? Let me just, okay. Here it is. Interfaith relations. Let me open this up. Yes, please. Go to site. Okay, see this here? Interfaith relations. Right now, the only thing that's there is interfaith relations between Latter-day Saints and Muslims. And you can see the pamphlet right here. And we actually went through this pamphlet um, in one of the videos. So you can see that to the church, uh, this is pretty important. And I would hazard a guess that it's because they want to be prepared for the Islamic world post-millennium. Because we don't know how many of them um, will accept Christ. Uh, the assumption is, I think, based on remarks from... Uh, uh, oh, his name escapes me right now. The young men's, uh, I think he's the second counselor. Oh my God, uh, Brad Wilcox, right? Brad Wilcox. Let's see, Elias Brad Wilcox. Yeah, Brad Wilcox. He was talking about one time how uh, when this happens, when Christ comes, there's going to be many, 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 many people that are going to want to convert to the church because Christ will identify himself with the church. So, um, with that in mind, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that Islam would be any, be any exception because many good people that value truth, when they see this happen, it doesn't matter what their religion, what their religion is, they, they value the truth. They want to do what God wants and, um, they'll adapt. It may be hard and they, you know, but when they see this and he identifies himself, there's gonna be many good, genuine people <clears throat> of whatever faith. They'll be like, okay, well, this is it. Christ, Jesus Christ, he's, um, you know, redeemer of the world. He is the Messiah. Um, and this is his church. And so they'll join. Uh, I might note here that BYU had a Islamic World Today conference. And this is actually something that I... Where'd it go? Yes, go to website. Yes, you don't need to ask me. Um, they had this. I kind of want to watch all these, but... Anyway, going back here, so that, that's the context. That's why I think that this is important. And I think it's significant here that she's visited with them 
twice. Okay, twice. And it doesn't really give a very good explanation. You know, uh, I mean, what what about um, uh, the church meeting with Bahrain's uh, ambassador? Why hasn't why hasn't that happened twice? Or why hasn't that made church news? What what about uh, Egypt? Uh, the church meeting with Egyptian leaders, you know, so it, it kind of stands out a little bit. It says the ambassador met with the church's first presidency, uh, President Russell M. Nelson, President Dallin A. Jokes, and President Henry B. Eyring. Uh, now, this is Princess Rima. Princess Rima was also greeted by Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Elder Anthony D. Perkins, president of the church's Middle East slash Africa North area. So it's appropriate because President Bednar, he's over this area. That's the area that he's assigned. And I want to just add one more thing to this video because uh, now this is interesting. You know, I've talked about Elder Bednar a few times on the channel. I think it's significant that his first name is David. Okay. <laughs> David is a loaded name. It's associated with Christ. It's associated with uh, the right to the kingship of Israel. Right, because it descends through David's line after Saul was unworthy and he, you know, he killed himself. Uh, after that, it was David, and it, and it never changed. And that's why it was significant that Christ descended through David because he, uh, he was the rightful political heir uh, to the throne of Israel. Okay, so having a having an apostle whose name is David is already interesting. Uh, having an apostle whose name is David and he is assigned the Middle East, even more interesting, right? Elder Bednar stood out when he was called because he was really young compared to his counterparts. Uh, he even pointed that out in his very first talk, how, you know, one of these things is not like the others. Um, now, Elder Bednar's uh, thanks, or sorry, Elder Bednar Thanks to my friend Daniel from Spain, he pointed something out that I did not know before, and uh, he gave me permission to to share this. Um, by the way, he has a he has a YouTube channel. Let me pull up my channel page. Okay, so if you're on my home page, you scroll down, and I have the featured channels. Okay, featured channels. Um, Actually, pretty soon there's going to be an interview with me and Betty Horn. Uh, stay tuned for that. And here's everyone else that I've talked to. I have Daniel because he he actually had a YouTube page or YouTube channel before me. It's right here, L Alvarez D. And um, he puts together a lot of like quotes and things like that. So I would encourage you to I would encourage you to subscribe to him. He's done. A lot of work, but he pointed out to me this. Is Elder Bednar a Jew? The vast majority of Americans with European origin have roots in Western Europe, countries uh, that were on the west side of the Iron Curtain during the Cold War. Of those, of those whose ancestors came from the other part of the continent, so the eastern side, usually before the Cold War, the proportion of German or Jewish origin is really high. In the case of the Germans, most of whom arrived in the 19th century, they immigrated from parts that were not even Germany. Germany was unified at the end of the 20th century. Austria or Switzerland, uh, nor even from countries, independent German states from Germany came to be. They were often, they were very often from areas ruled by Poles, Hungarians, Romanians, Czechs, Slavics, and even from the Volga region of Russia. Side note, back then, Hungary, part of Romania, uh, Chechia was respectively ruled by Austria-Hungary. It's the same with the Jews, for they, for they immigrated to America mostly in the 19th century from the, e the same Eastern European areas. So when you see an American with an Eastern European last name, and sometimes a German one, then you have to think that a high percentage of them have Jewish origin. Many folks have lost their Jewish identity, but still have Jewish origin. Their last names, their their last names that are typically Jewish. Okay, there are last names that are typically Jewish, like Kaplan, Kapayan, Chaplin, Cohen, Khan, Cowan, 
Levite, Levine, Levitt, Lewinsky. And we've talked about that before on the channel, right? Uh, the first set here, like Copland, Chaplin, Cohen, this would be the priests, right? The descendants of Aaron, um, of the tribe of Levi, but the, the descendants of Aaron that were the priests. And then, of course, Levite, Levine, that would be um, the Leviim or the, the Levites, right? So their last names in, in Judaism is very important because that's how they identify themselves as Levite or as a, Co as a Cohen. Okay, even though the holders may not be Jewish, there are other last names that are not ne not necessarily typically Jewish and that are Gentile, but, but that quite a few Jews hold them. As seen among the folks below, several people with the last name Bednar, or close variants, are Jews. There's even a Jewish scholar and author of a book on Judaism among them. Now, Daniel's going to show some pictures uh, further down, but I wanted to... Um, you know, validate this. I wasn't quite not questioning Daniel, but um, just you know, on my own, do my own homework and stuff. And here on AmericanLastNames.us, you have Bednar, and it says origin Jewish, Czech, Slovakian, Croatian, Romanian, Austrian, Hungary, uh, Hungarian. On um, Chicago Jewish News, uh, I've, I cited another article from them recently uh, talking about the Jubilee. But uh, it says here, it like has a bunch of different names, you know, is BM a Jewish name? Um, you know, is Bed uh, is Bednarek a Jewish name? Bednarek was a Polish and Jewish occupational name for a cooper who made tubs and barrels. There are many variants of the name, including Bednars, Bednarski, <clears throat> Bednarek, and Bednar. Okay. So this uh, Chicago Jewish News website is talking about how Bednar is, um, it is a common, uh, well, maybe not common, but it is mostly a Jewish name, right? Um, and then it goes through like a bunch of other names here too. All right. And then on Ancestry.com, uh, this one says the Bednar's family history and it confirms it as well. Polish and Jewish from Poland, occupational name for a Cooper, uh, Polish Bednars. Okay. So um, we don't know if Elder Bednar has a Jewish background from his father's side. Being Jewish is inherited from the mother, but given that a really a really large percentage of Eastern Europeans, Eastern Europeans were Jewish, it's highly likely that he has a Jewish paternal background. Uh, more interesting is to speculate is to speculate with the idea that he might be a Cohen and is inherited from that's inherited from father to son. Yeah. So um, now let me let me make a note here because in our church, as far as I know, we we don't really go by the Jewish definition of what makes a Jew. Um, we would we would respect obviously the way that they identify themselves and it's through the matrilineal line but as far as you know as we're looking for scattered israel i'm not so sure that with heavenly father or through the lord's eyes that it's that he uh determines it based on a matrilineal line i think that may just be a uniquely jewish um doctrine i haven't really heard much about it so so if you think about that from like the true perspective, it very well could be that if he is descended on the father's side, that he would be considered uh, Jewish or, dis well, yeah, descending from Judah, Jewish, um, you know, by the Lord's definition of scattered Israel or of Israel, whatever, whatever you want to say. So that's interesting to note. And it yeah, so it, it's interesting. So the implications are that he might be the first of the brethren with a Jewish and maybe even a Levite origin. Now, see, I don't know where that's coming in, the Cohen and Levite origin. Um, because, again, they would normally go by Cohen, Khan, Cowan, or Levite, Levine, Levitt. So I, I don't know... I don't know about that, but I mean, who the heck knows? 
Not only, not only that, because the Levites of old were known for their musical talent. Not by chance nowadays, including the 20th century, quite a few celebrated musicians in the world, and specifically in the United States, have last names like Cohen. Guess what? The current Mormon Tabernacle Choir conductor is named Mike Levitt. That is interesting to me, because Levitt, not so much the Kohanim, uh, but the Leviim, they were the ones that would uh, have choir and play music in the temple, in the ancient temple. So there, there's a lot of Levites today, and, and I was talking to one just a couple weeks ago, the Israeli Naz, uh, Levite Nazarite, and, you know, he's interested in music, and that's something I think a lot of the Leviim are interested in, because that's they, they're called to do that, to perform. That's one of their duties in the temple on top of other things. Um, so, yeah, so that's fascinating that we might have a Levite that is over the Tabernacle Choir. <laughs> um, am I implying that he has Jewish origin? I, I don't really know. Perhaps his last name comes from an old British Gentile family. But perhaps, well, in the past, in the Middle Ages or before, his last name was de a derivation of Levite. I just discovered that Levitt is indeed a British Middle Ages last name. Yeah, but it could. I mean, you don't know. Who knows? Uh, both conclusions might be entirely far-fetched or downright erroneous, or we might have the first member of the Brethren, first presidency or 12, that descends from Jews, um, even from the line of Aaron. And at the, at the same time, that a first member of the tabernacle choir, whichever name, whichever name has now, even the conductor, that also descends from them, and specifically from Levites. Both roles, priesthood and music, are really influential on us to get closer to God, as much today as in Israel's ancient times. Speculating even further, uh, if these chosen men are Jews or Levites, at least in origin, perhaps this is a sign that we're transitioning, transitioning from a more Gentile, but in, rea in reality, a lost ten triber to a um, Jewish one. And that could be. He um, includes some pictures down here. You know, here's uh, like Caroline Bednar returned to JFS. This is Jewish family service of St. Paul. Uh, here's another one, uh, Georgina Bednar. And she talks about her, you know, like a, like a, uh, family like a family thing you, you can like read it if you want but her last name is bednar she's jewish um it looks like there's some more bednar hungry let's see oh yeah jewish names it says right here hungry jewish names adam bednar um holocaust survivors judy judy bednar the hebrew mass masoretic text inerrancy preserved through divine providence uh, by Dr. L. Bednar. Bednar coat of arms. Uh, does it say Jewish here? No, it just, oh yeah, it was a Polish and Jewish occupational name. Uh, this person, Jill Bednar, managing funeral director at Dallas Jewish Funerals. Levitt, an Anglo-Norman name variant of an Ashkenazi Jewish surname. See? It, I'm willing to bet that Levitt actually is derived from Judaism, even though it was, um, you know, changed to be more Anglo. Let's see. And then it just goes back to the beginning. So that is some really interesting stuff to think about. Daniel, thank you so much for sharing this with us and for sharing it with me. He, he tagged me in it. So that's how I found out about it. Um, so looking at this again, look at this picture. You have the president of the church. We have the ambassador from Saudi Arabia, essentially from the world headquarters of um, Islam. And I'm not saying that because like Islam doesn't have like a central leadership. So I'm not saying it like that, but um, an ambassador from maybe the most important country in Islam and then you have Elder Bednar back here in the background. And if he is considered Jewish, like who knows what it says in this patriarchal blessing, he may be. 
uh, from Judah or Levi or something like that. But whatever the case, his last name is Bednar, and it seems to have a pretty strong Jewish connection. Here we have someone that <clears throat> maybe descended um, from Judah, from the, the southern kingdom. You know, all right here in the same room. And he's the one that's over the Middle East. Here's a picture of all of them. President Nelson and the princess in the middle. Elder Bednar over here, right? And then there she is with, um, this is the Relief Society General Presidency. So she met with them. And I read in this article, they showed her the, uh, yeah, here it is. They showed her the new pamphlet. Uh, her, Excellency, her Excellency praised a new pamphlet produced by the church called Muslims and Latter-day Saint Beliefs. Uh, Latter-day Saints, Beliefs, Values, and Lifestyles. Um, again, I will put this. I'll put this in the description if you want to read it. Yeah, pull, actually, pull it up right here. And I would encourage you to do so if you don't mu know much about Islam, because they, there's a lot. There's a lot we actually have in common with them. There's a lot. Uh, just for example, alcohol. They don't drink alcohol, and neither do we. Uh, whereas in Judaism, they do. So this is something that we have in common with Islam that we do not have in common with with uh, Judaism. All right, so that's going to be it for this one. I just wanted to call this to your attention. <clears throat> just another uh, really important meeting with world leaders. I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about Elder Bednar. And um, that's a very interesting idea, you know, if he has that descendancy. He may have a really, really important rule or important role moving into the future. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. So if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Put your uh, thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it and I'll talk to you guys later.